Good morning. It is so good to see everybody today. Hope everyone's had a great week and a great weekend and looking forward to the week ahead since this is a holiday week. Hopefully some of you will be able to take some time off, maybe spend some time with family and enjoy that time together. Want to encourage all of you that can to be back this evening at 6 o'clock. Tonight is going to be our monthly singing night and devotional. And hope that you are able to come back and join us for that service. We always have an enjoyable time together, joining our voices in, uh, in song to God. And also, continue to support our Wednesday night series. I thank everyone that has been able to be here for these lessons thus far, would agree we have had outstanding lessons thus far. And we've got a lot more to come. Uh, As announced this week, Brother Aaron Dodson from the Washington Avenue Congregation in Jonesboro will be with us. Uh, Brother Aaron is a young man, a very dynamic speaker. If you've not had an opportunity to hear him, try try to be here Wednesday night. I know that you will... Be encouraged by his lesson. This morning, I want to start by telling you this. I have some bad news and I have some good news. What do you want to hear first? Now, most of the time when someone says that to us, I know at least from my perspective, I think, well, let's get the bad news over with first. Well, that's what we're going to do this morning. Because if we look at the passage of Scripture, here the first few verses of Ephesians chapter 2, we could subtitle these verses in that way. The bad news and the good news. And what we're going to see as we continue looking at this series of lessons from the book of Ephesians uh, pertaining to this subject of the fact that as children of God, we are stronger when we're together. And noting many of the things that Paul reveals to us in this wonderful book that go along with blessings that we only obtain if we're together. Well, this morning, we're going to be talking about another one of those, and that is we are made alive together with Christ. But we're going to look at this from the standpoint of how Paul presents this Starting out with the bad news, but then presenting the good news. Last week, from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, we talked about that Paul wanted us as Christians to understand that the same power that facilitated the resurrection of Christ is now being extended to us as children of God. But continuing with that same mentality... We come into Ephesians chapter 2, and what we find Paul doing here is giving us a compare and contrast, a description of what our life is like before receiving that power and then after receiving that power. Well, the before image is one that is not very pleasant. And those were the verses that I had Brother David share with us in our scripture reading this morning, those first three verses. Notice Paul says, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as The others. You know, that doesn't paint a very pretty picture of us, does it? The way that our life was, that's not a very good image. In fact, if you look at the kind of terminology that Paul is using here, really what he's saying is you can't get much worse than you are before you come to Christ. Because the way that he describes it, he says, before you become to Christ, You're dead. You're dead. Because sin separates us from God, just like when that first sin was committed in the Garden of Eden. We see when Adam and Eve committed that sin, they died spiritually. 
And from that point forward, each and every individual, when they reach an accountable age and they commit sin, guess what? We die spiritually. Think about Adam and Eve with me for just a moment. Folks, they didn't have it very difficult, did they? No, they had things pretty good. They had a beautiful home. They had everything they could possibly need provided for them. And they had only one rule. Do not eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. If you can abstain from that one thing, we're good. But you know, the devil had other plans. And he showed his motives clearly. When he comes to Eve and he confronts her in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 4, and he says, what, what has God told you about this tree? What's God told you would happen if you eat it? Oh, God says if we even touch this tree, we're going to die. Satan said, that's not right. He said, you will not surely die. Well, he persuaded Eve. She then persuaded Adam. And we find that after they had eaten of that forbidden fruit, after sin became a reality to mankind, they were still alive physically, were they not? Yes, they continued to live on in the flesh. But we find that due to their sin, there were some consequences there. They were driven out of the garden. They were driven out of the fellowship of God. But also, they died spiritually. And they were devoid of the saving power, the life-sustaining power of the tree of life. And so as a result of that, they began to age. And eventually they reached the point where they died physically. Well, we need to understand that each of us here today who are of accountable age... We've talked in the past. There's not a set age that a person reaches accountability. It's the point that we reach when we have the ability to understand right and wrong, where we have the ability to understand what is sin and what is not. And people reach that age at different times, at different stages. But each one of us who have reached the age of accountability, guess what? We have sinned. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3 and verse 23. And as a result of that, each and every person who is here today, who is of accountable age, guess what? We have died spiritually. That's bad news, isn't it? That's bad news. But it gets even worse. We understand that if we die physically while we are still dead spiritually, then we're going to stay dead spiritually. We're not going to have another opportunity to change. In the book of Revelation, Jesus allows John to see an image of what judgment is going to be like. And on the day of judgment, we're told that all of the dead are going to rise and stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Those who died in a spiritual state, those who died in an unsaved state, they will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. But that book tells us that the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars are going to have their place in the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death, Revelation 21 verse 8. And so what that shows us is that there are many people who are going to die physically while still dead in their sins only to be raised from the dead to stand in judgment to then die spiritually for all of eternity. Paul says that is what non-Christians have to look forward to. He said that is where non-Christians currently stand in retrospect to eternity. But if you look again at our lesson text, Ephesians 1, or Ephesians 2 verses 1 and 3, notice how he starts this. And you, he made alive. And you he made alive who... What's the next word? Were. 
were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Simply put, what Paul is telling us there, he says, folks, he says, the reason you died spiritually is because you allowed yourself to follow after the ways of the world. You allowed yourself to be led by the prince of the power of the air. Now, this is a very interesting description that's given here, the prince of the power of the air. Who is this? Who is this evil influencer that Paul is talking about? Well, something I found that was very interesting, the Jews in the first century, you know, we've talked many times about the fact that the Jews were a very superstitious people. They tried to find ways to explain everything going on around them. Well, the Jews in the first century had a belief that reality functions within three different realms. You have the first realm, which is the earth, where we live. All of the things that we are able to to witness and engage in with our five senses. This is the first realm, the first reality. But then beyond that, there is a second reality. And they claim that this is what we would refer to as our atmosphere and what we would think of as space and outer space, the universe. To the Jews, guess what they referred to that second realm as? The air. Then they believe that there is a third realm. And that is heaven, where God is. Now coming back to this designation where Paul refers to this evil influencer as the prince of the power of the air. Guess what the Jews in the first century believe takes place within that second realm that they refer to as the air. They believe that is the dwelling place of Satan and his demons. They believe that somewhere out there in the cosmos, out there in outer space somewhere, you've got Satan and all of his demons meeting together and functioning to carry about their tasks. And something that's interesting, to me at least, there have been some archaeological finds within some of the older parts of the city of Ephesus that really display this superstitious aspect of the Jews. You know, the Jews, they believed in angels, they believed in demons, they believed in in these what we refer to as heavenly beings, but they tried to come up with some way of explaining where they are, how they function, what their work consists of. And so they came up with some pretty fanciful ideas. Well, there have been some discoveries where there were some ancient Jewish prayers that had been engraved in stone, that were discovered in the ruins of some of the ancient synagogues in the city of Ephesus. And one line in those prayers was, protect me from the demons of the air. And so this alludes back to this superstitious mentality that they had, that that the demons are there functioning somehow in the atmosphere. You know, they're not right here with us. They're not with God. They're in their own realm doing their own thing. But in Ephesians 6, verses 11 and 12, I think Paul gives us some information that clears up who he's referring to. He says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. That last statement Spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Folks, this is a continuation of the description of Satan that's already being given in this passage. But the language in the Greek that is used in that line is the exact same language that is used in Ephesians 2 and verse 2 to refer to the prince of the power of the air. 
Folks, this is not talking about a band of demons floating around in outer space trying to tempt you to sin. It's talking about Satan and his influence. Satan is the one that is tempting us to sin. Satan is the one that is trying to win our soul over to his cause. And so we understand that the way that we come to the point that we die spiritually is we come to follow Satan rather than follow God. We allow Satan to be the one that influences our life rather than God. But here's something that we need to understand, and we're getting around to the good news now. Although Satan has the power to tempt us, Satan does not have the power to force us to sin. You know, God has given Satan the authority to try us up to a point. We have the ability as children of God through this power that we talked about last week that has been extended toward us, we have the ability to overcome Satan every time. Every time. But something that we need to keep in mind as a result of this. Yes, Satan can tempt us. But due to the fact that he cannot make us sin, he cannot force us to sin, who is the only one that will be accountable if we sin? We are. You know, we would love to be able to stand around on the day of judgment, wouldn't we? And be able to say, well, you know, Tom, he, he tempted me to sin. I did what Tom tempted me to do. Or, or Barb, you know, she, she led me to do this. Or Louise. You know, we would love to be able pointing fingers out at everybody. But we must understand that the finger of God's judgment is always going to rest on who? The individual. The one that committed that sin. Yes, there may be influences out there that lead us to sin. And they may have to be held accountable for the sins they commit that lead us to sin. But the sin I commit, I will be held accountable for that. I will have to answer for that. I'm the only one that's responsible. And so what I have to come to the realization of, especially if I'm not a child of God, and this is who I'm talking to particularly at this moment right now, if you are not a Christian and you have reached the age of accountability, you must realize you have sinned, you have died spiritually. And if you remain in that state, you are the only one to blame. That's the bad news. Now you want to hear the good news? Yeah. Once again, look at that first verse of Ephesians chapter 2. And you, he's talking to Christians here, folks. And you, he made alive. Who were, that's past tense, who were dead in trespasses, and sins. But then if you skip down to verse 4, I think we see two key words there. But God. Remember, we looked at the bad news there in the first three verses. You come down to verse 4 and what do we see? But God. Yes, we were in a terrible state. Yes, we were lost. Yes, we were without hope. Yes, we were destined for condemnation. But God, God didn't want you to stay that way. That's the good news. Yes, you were dead. Yes, you may be dead today, but you don't have to stay that way. That's the good news. God has done something about that problem. But something that I want us to think about today is this. No matter how sinful you may currently be, no matter how many bad things may be going on in your life right now, no matter 
how bad the world around us is getting, no matter how scared you may be of the future, every concern that you have, I want you to start ending it with these two words, but God. Think about that. But God. You know, there are a lot of things taking place in the world around us today that I cannot stand. There are a lot of things that sicken me that I see going on in the world around us, things that our people are being forced to accept and tolerate and things of that nature. But God. You know, there are many things that when I look to the future, they trouble me. I don't know what the future holds for my children. For my grandchildren. I don't know what the future holds for tomorrow. I don't know what the future holds for our country. That's unsettling, isn't it? But God. You know, my life is just in shambles. I'm so sinful. I'm so far away from God. I don't know that God would want me. But God. So what has God done for us? Look at Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 8. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come He might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. God recognized that man was going to sin. The Bible tells us that God had the plan of salvation in mind before He ever created the world. He knew that man was going to sin. But God loves us so much that He didn't want us to stay in that condition. God loves us so much that He wanted to give us an opportunity to change that. Now something that we need to note from this Notice that Paul tells us that this this salvation that we receive, the ability to be made alive and to have our sins taken away, says this is not due to our works. It's not because we have earned it. It's not because we deserve it. Folks, we're not deserving of it. It's not because God owes us anything. God has done that for you and for me because He loves us. Because He wants us to be saved. The only reason, folks, that we have the opportunity to be a child of God today is because God loves you. That's the only reason you have that opportunity. God loves you. And as we started this series with, He wants you in His family. He wants to adopt you into His family and make that family even stronger by bringing us together. But then Paul tells us, he says another reason that God has done this is so that He can show just how gracious He can be. Have you ever stopped and thought about just how wicked mankind can be, just how wicked mankind is, and how much love and grace God must have in order to provide salvation to us. Paul says God has done this so that people will look to Him and see His loving and generous nature. But then he says, but in appreciation for our receiving of God's grace, we need to make sure we're giving credit where credit is due. 
We need to be praising God and glorifying Him and thanking Him for what He has done for us. He's telling us that those who are children of God, those who were raised from the waters of baptism, who were raised to walk in a newness of life, a new, resurrected, spiritual life, He says, you are saved, you are made alive, but it's not because you have done anything to facilitate that. It's not your works. But He says, but now that you are alive spiritually. He says, only now do your works have power. Only now can your works be considered good works. Because listen to these words again. We are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So notice here, Paul starts out by saying, he says, your salvation is not because of your works. You cannot do enough works to merit your salvation, but when you receive the grace of God and you obey the gospel of Jesus Christ by faithfully submitting to the gospel, he said, then you will be able to do the kind of works that God wants you to do. The difference that we see is that good works, truly good works, can only be accomplished in Christ Jesus. Notice what he says. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Before becoming Christians, before being made alive spiritually, we were dead. We were unable to do anything truly good. But now that we're in Christ, now that we are alive spiritually, the works that we engage in, that we engage in as we execute the the living of the Christian life, those are classified as good works. And you see the difference here is in that one four-letter word, good You know, before we became children of God, we may have thought we were doing good works, but in actuality, all we were doing was work. It wasn't really accomplishing things that were good. Now, I'm not talking about this from the standpoint of uh, of worldly good. You know, the things that we do in our community and things of that nature. You know, there are many things that non-Christians engage in that we could look at and we could say that those are good, they're worthwhile, they're beneficial in certain ways. But when it comes to good works, good spiritual works, folks, if you're not in Christ, you're dead. You cannot engage in those kind of works. And so it's not benefiting you. It's not benefiting the church. It's not benefiting God. Hence we see this term, made alive together with Christ. What this is alluding to is the fact. One person can accomplish some good works but all Christians working together, being joined together. Think of the good that can be accomplished. Folks, now that we're in Christ, those who are children of God, now that we've been made alive spiritually, our works have been made alive as well. Spiritual power, spiritual influence is now there. But let's go back for just a moment. When we were dead. All of us here today who are children of God at one point were dead. And that's a terrifying thought. All of us here today who are children of God at one point were destined for eternal condemnation. But God. But God made us alive together. Provided us a way that we could have the forgiveness of our sins. 
provided us a way that we could be made alive spiritually. And that we would never have to worry about death again. That old man of sin is put to death in these waters. When are we made alive spiritually? When we are raised from the waters of baptism. We are raised to walk in a newness of life. Our sins have been washed away. We've been added to the church. And we begin that very day engaging ourselves in those works that that classify us as Christians. We do those things that God expects of us out of our appreciation for what He has done. For making us alive. And so as we bring this lesson all together this morning, if you are not a Christian today, I cannot say it any more plainly. You are dead. If you are not a Christian today, you are dead. But remember, that's just the bad news. The good news is you don't have to stay dead. God wants to bring you back to life spiritually. Christ died and was resurrected that we can now be made alive. Now that we can be resurrected to a new life through obeying the gospel. Through placing your faith in Jesus as the Son of God by repenting of your sins. Confessing that faith you have in Christ and being baptized. You can be made alive spiritually. When you rise from those waters you will be alive. No longer. Will you be dead? Yes, as we see here in Ephesians, yes, we can say we were dead. But praise be to God, we're not anymore. Praise be to God that He has made us alive. That He has taken away our sins. And then we as children of God, we go on to live lives that honor and glorify God, that encourage others to come to Him. Hence the words of Jesus, Let your light so shine before men that they might see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The works He's talking about are these good works that only can be worked by those who are alive spiritually. And we do that to try to encourage others to come to Christ. But if you're here today as a Christian and you realize that you're not living your life the way that you should, you are not engaging in those good works, you are not trying to influence others to come to Christ, then I encourage you today to renew that zeal. Get active again in those good works. But above all, do not let a day pass by without expressing your praise and your thanks to God for what He has done by making us alive together. This morning, if you examine yourself and there's a spiritual need in your life that we can assist you with, we encourage you to come forward. Make that known at this time while we stand and sing.